things don't have normal elastins. They're too, they're not elastic enough. They're too compliant, then the airways collapse and you can't get it out. Secretions, airway edema, asthma, all of these things, right? Anything that causes the pipes to be clogged imposes a resistive load. And I'm gonna show you in part three what a resistive load is and feels like to make it so you will never ever forget it. There's another thing about resistive loads. Do you remember Reynolds number? It's between two and 4,000 and it's, I don't remember the equation, it doesn't matter, but it's the transition between laminar to turbulent flow. And in laminar flow, you've just got stuff moving, everything's moving along the, you know, the, the same way along there. And in turbulent flow, you start to get this kind of action, right? And it's only moving along because along of the shear stresses and so on and so forth. There's a whole physics behind that and a whole physiology, which is actually somewhat interesting. But as you start to breathe faster, you increase resistance because of turbulent flow through any airway of any caliber. Okay, so this person here, this IPF person that's breathing 50 times a minute, they're sacrificing turbulence and increasing airway resistance to come to naturally to some middle ground where the, the, where the, the, uh, where the overall work that is required to move a certain amount of air is minimized. Okay, so now let's, let's go back to the patient. Let's look at this person who's breathing 40 times a minute and says, Doc, I can't breathe, can't breathe, not won't breathe. Then I look at that person, the first thing I do is I say, okay, do they look weak? Do they look cachexic? Do they look whatever? And that helps me understand. I put that, I chalk that up. I say, I understand a little bit. I can't do anything about it right now except for substitute mechanical support for their lack of uh, musculoskeletal support. So BiPAP is a great one. That's why we use BiPAP in chronic respiratory failure, people with neuromuscular diseases, ALS, all these things, kyphoscoliosis, all, all these things, right? So that, that's the first thing I do as I look at them. Then I look at them and I say, okay, what, are the, what mechanical disadvantage does he have? And if he's just got too much inertial mass of his respiratory system, well, I know that having him recumbent is not good if he's a, a great big guy, right? So sitting him up, getting him out of bed, that's kind of the only thing I can do about that right now, right? Other than if I can, unless I can convince him to lose weight. Elastic loads is pretty much anything you see on the chest X-ray that might, or in the patient, that might make you think that the respiratory system is stiffer and you've got to see what you can do to relieve those loads, if, if anything. Well, oftentimes, you just have to, you can get rid of edema quickly. You can expand lung and it's atelectatic. That's an elastic load, right? Because you're down here and the alveoli are closed, right? They're, they're in a terrible position. So you, you look, at, look at those kind of things. And then I look and I say, okay, are they wheezing? Do they have mucus plugs? Do they have all of these other things? Is it possibly have upper airway obstruction? You know, or is there a variety of resistive loads that I can reduce or what do I have to do to temporize them until I treat these underlying problems? If somebody quote, can't breathe and they've got workload imbalance, the only thing you can do is restore balance to the system. That's what we're, that's what we're trying, to, trying to do. So these are the mechanical ones. The first one was, and workload imbalance was weakness. I'm gonna leave them on here for reference. And three is moving a lot of air. Okay, so um, I'm gonna have to erase some of this stuff to be able to talk then about why you might have to move a lot of air, okay? There are three or four, well, I won't forget them, but I, so one is that you have lots of exhaust. CO2 is exhaust. So increased CO2 production. Remember the three to four millimeters of mercury is in the resting state. So why would somebody, why would a patient have increased CO2 production? Fever, pain, anxiety, fear. Before beginning part one, we, uh, our team watched Luke Aiken jump from an airplane without a parachute and saw that his heart rate, while he was just in free fall, 
was 148, with little explanation other than abject terror. Now, there's a rule of thumb that your CO2 production goes up 10% for every degree Celsius. One degree Celsius. So if you go from 37 to 41, you just had a 40% increase in your CO2 production. Your heart rate also goes up 10 for every one degree Celsius. We can use some extrapolation and infer that if he started at 70 and went to 148, he more than doubled his resting CO2 production. His CO2 is, I bet you his respiratory rate is in the 30s, and I bet his CO2 production, he's, his CO2 is rising if he were apneic under those conditions at probably six or seven millimeters of mercury per minute, if not even higher than that. So terror can do it. Another one is overfeeding, because lipogenesis, the formation of fat, has a, has a respiratory quotient stoichiometrically of 8.0 instead of the 1.0 CO2 produced per O2 consumed. That's why sometimes you'll hear attendings talk about avoid overfeeding in the ICU. Obviously exercise, thyrotoxicosis, pregnancy, Paget's disease of bone, a variety of other hypermetabolic states, which are esoteric and not really, you know, not really practical. But all of these things increase your CO2 production. So if I doubled your CO2 production right now by having you on a, you know, a stationary bicycle or something like that, well, you'd have to breathe twice. You'd have to have an alveolar ventilation, which was twice of what it was in the basal state, right? Okay, increase CO2 production. Another one, just because of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, the equilibrium, is acidosis. That's why you hyperventilate with Kussmaul with DKA, right? Because your, your, your buffer system screwed up. So you have to, the buffer system makes it so you don't have to breathe, breathe as much. If you get acidemic, you have to breathe more. So acidosis is a load. So all of these, actually, these loads are moving a lot of air. The better way to call them is minute ventilation loads. Things that require you to increase your minute ventilation. Okay, CO2 production, increase CO2 production, um, acidosis, and the third one is probably the physiologically most sophisticated, but it's extremely important. If, the, if there's one thing about respiratory physiology that, which is widely underappreciated by people of all stripes, it's dead space. We said this morning that volume loss is, mo the, in my opinion, the most underappreciated chest X-ray finding especially among the, non, uh, the uninitiated, it's dead space fraction. Now let me tell you what dead space is. Dead space is dead weight. It is air that you're moving that doesn't participate in your goals. Just like, you know, what, what does it mean if he's carrying a lot of dead weight? Let me tell you exactly what it means. 2006, backpacking uh, in Montana with my buddy whose pack was way too hev heavy and he complained about it all day long. So the second morning, when he's packing up and packing everything, your pack is packed halfway up. My buddy and I went and got a couple of 10 pound rocks and stuffed them down in the bottom of his pack to increase, it was probably five pound rocks. He had like an extra 10 pounds. He picks up, God darn it, I thought I ate some food last night. My pack seems even heavier than I did before. And he carried them all the way to the next. So th that is dead weight. It's weight that he had to carry that didn't help him achieve his goals. In so much as the goals of breathing are gas exchange, particularly ventilation, then any air that you move that doesn't participate in gas exchange is dead space. Dead space is dead weight. So the most obvious kind of dead space would be if you, well, that's a trachea, and I don't really want trachea here, but um, is if you got a clot to the pulmonary artery, now this whole lung is dead space. It's pure dead space because it's not participating in gas exchange. So look what happens. You now have to move through this mechanical system with whatever strength you have and whatever mechanical disadvantages, are, whatever the resistive loads are, whatever the elastic loads are, whatever the inertial mass of that system is, you now have to move all this whole lung full of air for nothing. You get nothing out of it, which means you have to increase your tidal volume or your respiratory rate to the other lungs. So you have to increase your overall minute ventilation to achieve the same degree of gas exchange. And dead space is, is very, very important and under-recognized. So, but how do you know there's dead space? And why haven't you ever heard about this? Why haven't you heard about applied breath? Because it's, you can't study it. It's extremely hard to measure the dead space fraction. You can have a PaCO2 and you can collect uh, a bunch of gas in what's called a Douglas bag. It's a gas impermeable bag. And then you have to go measure the partial pressure of the exhaled gas in a laboratory. You can't practically do it. But I'll tell you how you know somebody has excess dead space. Any parenchymal lung disease. 
just like they have increased elastic, uh, uh, elastic loads if they have parenchymal lung disease, will they have increased dead space fraction if they have any parenchymal uh, lung disease? And so now you can see that the little old lady that has emphysema, which gives her elastic loads because she's breathing too high, she's weak in the first place and she's all cachexic, and then she gets a pneumonia, which increases her dead space, and it also makes her have VQ mismatch, which is why she's on oxygen. But oxygen's so easy, you just give more of it, right? And you fix the parenchymal lung disease, however you have to do it. But understanding why they can't breathe, she, it's not that she can't breathe. Most of the people that are intubated have SATs above 88%, right? You know, but they can't breathe because they can't sustain ventilation because of the workload imbalance on the system. That's what's actually going on. And a huge proportion of what we do when we give mechanical assistance for breathing, and especially invasive mechanical ventilation. So all the BiPAP that we use is to compensate for these imbalances. And when we intubate somebody, a massive part of what we do is just getting rid of pain, anxiety, and fear. Because that can, I don't know the data on this, but based on Luke Aiken and other you know, practical, real world, incontrovertible facts, uh, you can estimate that just the sheer terror of not being able to breathe and thinking that you're dying, doc, I can't breathe, can double your minute ventilation and now you're in a downward spiral. At the, at, the, at the worst possible time, you have increased CO2 production, you've got dead space ventilation, and you're breathing fast at first, and then guess what happens? What happens when you get rapid and shallow? Okay, rapid shallow. Rapid shallow is when you know you're gonna fail, and I'm gonna make you fail for part three. Tomorrow we're gonna fail. Normal people are gonna fail. <laughs> when you start to fail, when you start to fail, your huge breaths that you're taking, because of the dead space and the increased CO2 production at least, you're taking huge breaths. Um, so let's say you had a thousand cc's, and your anatomic dead space is what? Uh, is it like 150 cc's. 150, yeah. So now your effective inhalation is 850, right? Now let's say you've got another 30% dead space fraction because you got parenchymal lung disease. So now your effective inhalation is 550 for each 1,000 cc breath. Just ballpark, right? Mm -hmm. What happens now when you, you tire out and you go rapid and shallow? What does that mean? What if you had 500 cc's minus 450, minus 150, minus 300? Now you've got an effective ventilation of just 50 cc's, right? Now you're breathing 50, 60 times a minute, and before long you're gonna be breathing zero to zero times per minute. That's when you, that's when you're, and finally you're agonal, right? And never mistake, won't breathe for agonal. They're two totally different things, right? And if you won't breathe, if you can't breathe or won't breathe for bad enough, eventually you will become agonal. So your your dead space fraction is a function of your tidal volume with each breath. So by the time you're rapid and shallow, you're done. Stick a fork in you. And that's why we talk about rapid shallow breathing, but that's a different thing. RSBI rapid shallow, Yang Tobin. We could have a whole whole talk on that. Mm -hmm. Any questions about any of that stuff? I'm going to shut off the recording.